Portuguese trip in 1985, I was mentioning how after purchasing that new G3, which looked, as Mr. Armstrong said when they drove up to it, looks just like the G2. However, it was, instead of having three million miles of flying on it, as the G2 did over a period of 14 years, the brand new G3 in August of 1995 was brand new, other than the testing flights that they'd put it through to make sure it was airworthy. And Mr. Armstrong flew to China, he flew to Thailand, flew to several other places we saw yesterday, and now we're picking up the trip where he's going into Thailand and do something else. I hope I'm sick down by the walls of the Red Sea collapsing. They are described in Daniel 11 are accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. The second part of the promise in Luke 21, 36, for going above and beyond just keeping the commandments. That doesn't earn you salvation or entry into the spring harvest first resurrection you got to go over and above christ says you need to be watching the daily four active events that he explained in plain language in the early part of luke 21 and then in verse 36 where we're in between verse uh, the first four active seals and the fifth seal he's saying watch and pray always so that Figure out what's going wrong with the microphone. We'll explain later. Well, we got it back, so I can quickly tell you this. We were, were advised by Christ to watch and pray always so that we can have be accounted worthy of two wonderful things. First, in time order to escape the great tribulation coming that Mr. Armstrong is going to talk about in this section of the 1985 feast film on his trips overseas, showing how wonderfully God blessed the fruits and works of his end-time most faithful servant and apostle, Herbert Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong will be explaining in that next, the, after the fifth seal opens up, it'll commence with round three of World War, fulfilling Ezekiel 6.6. 6. We'll have that verse up on the screen when Mr. Armstrong shows in this video how horrible round three of World War is going to be, which is a reality that's coming. We're celebrating, we're in the fourth day now, we're at the early part of the fourth day, so we're about three and a half days into the millennium, millennium. prophetically that's about halfway. Uh, it's a seven day feast, we're three and a half days into it right now, that's halfway, we're about 500 years into, into symbolically, but in real life, we've got yet to see. Christ return on the Feast of Trumpets. We've yet to see Christ put away the devil on Day of Atonement. And we've yet to see the millennium actually start. We're in between this time before Christ returns and even before the fifth seal opens up. That's a three and a half year clock before Christ can return. And which is, again, going to commence with round three of World War, the most terrible, terrifying, dreadful time of war and battle upon this earth this earth has ever seen. And yet, it even it'll escalate to the Battle of Armageddon just before Christ returns. And unless he returned, man would blow all mankind off the face of this earth. But... Mr. Armstrong has enjoyed a warm friendship with Thailand's hard-working King Pumipan and Queen Sirikin. He has been impressed with their outstanding example of service to their people. Since 1971, the Ambassador Foundation has aided their majesties in projects to encourage the hill tribes to replace the opium poppy with a more profitable and less destructive cash crop. In a visit to Thailand in 1984, Mr. Armstrong was invited by Queen Sirikit to fly with her in the Royal Helicopter to a remote hill tribe settlement close to the border between Thailand and Burma. Queen showed Mr. Armstrong the progress that had been made in helping these backward people develop a more settled and prosperous standard of living.
Knowing Her Majesty's dedication to helping Thailand's poor while preserving their heritage, Mr. Armstrong assisted her in promoting a greater knowledge of fine quality Thai handicrafts. The Ambassador Television Studios produced an hour-long documentary which told the story of King Pumipon and Queen Sirikat's total dedication to their people. Mr. Armstrong personally presented their majesties with this videotape production. The royal family has honored Mr. Armstrong several times, decorating him in recognition of his long friendship and service to the Thai nation. Thank you, Your Majesty. A highlight in the long and productive relationship came in March 1985, when Her Majesty accepted Mr. Armstrong's invitation to visit Ambassador College for several days. Mr. Armstrong escorted the Queen on a personal tour of the college's beautiful Pasadena campus. Sirikit also attended a number of banquets and receptions in her honor. Present were many state and local dignitaries. So I think Mr. Armstrong and my husband have the same goal, the common goal, that is the harmony, the, the world harmony, and better understanding between people in all over the world. In conjunction with her visit, the largest display of ancient and modern Thai treasures ever exhibited outside of Thailand was showcased in the lobby of the Hall of Administration. stage of the Ambassador Auditorium, Mr. Armstrong introduced Queen Sirikit to an audience of distinguished businessmen and leaders of the local community. Ladies and gentlemen, Thun, and before I introduce Her Majesty, the Queen of Thailand, I'd like to say a few things about the royal family of Thailand. Their Majesties, the King and Queen of Thailand, have devoted their lives to the welfare of their people, to serving them. They go out among them personally. I spent one day with Her Majesty, the Queen, among one of their nomad tribes in the north. And Their Majesties are interested in going up and working with them. So now it's my very great pleasure to introduce a very dear and affectionate friend, Her Majesty Queen Sirikat of Thailand.
I am very happy today to visit the home base of Mr. Armstrong, a gentleman whom I consider to be my true personal friend as well as the friend of all men of goodwill in this world. Because of his wisdom, far-sightedness, and humanitarian heart, he knows it is meaningless to talk about security, democracy, and international cooperation when a large number of people still hardly have enough to keep body and soul together. I know that his financial aid to various projects has been extremely generous. But I think that he is most appreciated because of the spiritual impact he makes. To those who meet him, he is the symbol of the warm-hearted citizen of the advanced countries who is willing to understand, give encouragement, and lend a helping hand when needed. If the people of the world are ever to reach their full potential, it is important that the educated in all nations learn to cooperate and serve those less fortunate than themselves. The United Nations has been the most successful instrument for international cooperation so far. In the closing days of World War II, representatives of 51 nations met in San Francisco to lay the foundations of an organization that they hoped would once and for all provide a forum where nations could work out their differences at the conference table rather than on the battlefield. It is in many ways the most effective vehicle that man has ever devised to improve communication between nations. But in spite of dedicated and sincere effort, the United Nations has been unable to keep the peace. In June 1985, representatives of the world's nations gathered once again in San Francisco to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the United Nations. Delegates reviewed 40 years of achievement and considered the future of the world organization. Mr. Armstrong had reported the 1945 conference for the plain truth. Today, he has met with more heads of state and leaders of government than any other man alive. He was afforded a position of honor during the days of discussion and debate. If you asked me, what does the United Nations need most? More power or more money or both? My answer would be the United Nations needs above all the love, the understanding, the interest and the support of the peoples of all nations. The hardest thing for human beings to do is to set lofty goals and work hard for them while recognizing that they may never be fully realized. Yet this is what the United Nations is really all about. The failure of the United Nations to meet all its lofty aims is no cause for despair. We should continue to set high goals that inspire us to work harder and to persevere. It is said, according to United Nations studies, that we've had 154 conventional wars since 1945, fought on 71 countries, on the ground of 71 countries, with over 20 million people dead. It continues, even at this moment in time, at a measured loss of life of 1,000 people a day, 30,000 a month, ad infinitum. What would we do without the United Nations Forum on Arms Control and Disarmament? It is entirely possible that without it, the doomsday clock would already have struck midnight. 
Perhaps we can meet here again in San Francisco, 40 years from now, in the year 2025. And in the interim, because of the tireless work which is done, sanity may have intervened. And we will then be at a conference discussing a convention on the control of the proliferation of plowshares and pruning hooks. As one who has devotedly sat on the sidelines of the Security Council for nearly 40, 40 years, perhaps I may be forgiven for saying that there are moments, or have been moments and still are, when I feel that only an invasion from outer space is likely to reintroduce to the Security Council that spirit of unanimity and collegiate responsibility which the authors of the Charter were talking about. I sincerely hope I may be proved to be wrong. The UNESCO, the UN... Only three of the original signers of the United Nations Charter are alive today. They were invited to attend the commemoration conference and speak to the delegates. We who came together in those early days of the UN know that the most and certainly the best we could do at that time was to build the foundation. We can pride ourselves that the foundation is still intact. But the structure of a genuine peace has yet to be built. This is the continuing challenge for all those who understand that the human race cannot survive in a condition of world anarchy. It's not enough for the young generation to say we do not want a nuclear war. That's obvious. But if there is to be peacekeeping, there must be peacemaking. And the United Nations needs a tremendous expansion in the way in which solutions are worked out and brought forward. When we look ahead to the years of peace, we find that distressingly little is being contemplated to be done in this conference in the realm of the mind and spirit. It is to the spirit and mind of man, to his ideas and his attitudes, that we must devote considerable attention if the peace is going to be truly won. Unless we secure the right conditions for spiritual and intellectual health, and unless we determine the right positive ideas for which man should live, I am afraid all our work in this conference may prove to have been in vain. Have this particular... After his speech, Dr. Malik privately discussed with Mr. Armstrong what he considered to be the missing dimension in the philosophy of the United Nations representatives. There is an old wisdom in the Middle East, with which we are fully acquainted. You know, history began in the Middle East. I mean, the history of the Western world began in the Middle East, in Mesopotamia and Egypt, on the shores of Lebanon, the Phoenicians, then in Jerusalem, and so forth. Uh, one of the basic things that you find everybody believes in, Everybody without exception, in every village in Lebanon, in every village in Egypt, everywhere. One of the fundamental things, which nobody talks about here, because now you have, uh, with all respect for you, now you have outgrown this uh, old wisdom of the Middle East. One of the important things that we talk about is the devil. I'd like to see one man speak of the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, the devil has penetrated human hearts everywhere. In your heart, sir, and in mine, the devil is, quite, is contending with, with Christ all the time. He's contending with him in all sorts of ways. I can uh, reveal them to you at length. So uh, we believe that the devil is at work in the midst of all these events. And while the devil is at work and has not yet been completely conquered, vanquished, uh, we will never have peace. We will never have peace. You think the United Nations is going to bring about peace so long as the devil is around? We had a thousand people today at lunch, more than a thousand, maybe 1,500. I was sitting down and thinking all the time, Mr. Armstrong, all the time, what is going on in the minds of these people? Mm -hmm. Well, 
I'm not sure the devil was not there in the mind of these people. I'm not sure at all. Yeah. With all uh, their schemes and ideas and uh, uh, emotions and uh, uh, aspirations and plannings and uh, all kinds of things. The devil is at work. So this is a thing that if you ask anybody, any f peasant in Lebanon or in Egypt will tell you, of course the devil is at work. <laughs> <laughs> but here, 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 the devil has so much conquered you that you don't talk about him. You wouldn't dare talk about him. I didn't say conquered you. Uh, this is the wrong way of putting it. But he, he is so clever that one way with which he acts is to conceal himself. Today, few people realize that this is Satan's world. As Satan's rule of this earth draws nearer to the end, it becomes increasingly important for an ambassador of the kingdom of God to reach many nations with the warning of tribulation and the promise of peace. There is a special urgency in reaching the nations of the industrial world. For well, the prophecies show that it is these nations that will trigger the crisis that catapults the human race into the final trial. Since the end of the Second World War, Europe has known 40 years of peace, one of the longest periods without war in this continent's stormy history. After the destruction of the war, the nations have rebuilt. Behind the scenes, patient, cautious men have been working for future prosperity and the fulfillment of an old dream, a United States of Europe. Because of Europe's critical role in the fulfillment of prophecy, Mr. Armstrong has kept in contact with these architects of a united Europe. Such a man is Dr. Otto von Habsburg, son of the last Austrian emperor, and a leading member of the European Parliament. Dr. Mahabberg, yeah. I wonder if you can bring me up to date a little bit on the progress of the uh, unif unification Thank project you very here much. in Europe. I will tell you, uh, we have of course made a major breakthrough with the uh, enlargement. Uh, with the accession of Spain and Portugal, this was a major breakthrough. You see, uh, I have a little bit directly to do with it since I'm the first vice president of the mixed committee between the European Parliament and the Spanish Cortes. Uh -huh. So I was in the negotiations. When you, Europe starts uniting, which will be the strongest body, the European Parliament or the... What, what will be the strongest? I hope it will be balanced. I think there is a fair chance of it being balanced. You see, I wouldn't be happy about any of the powers to being too strong. They should all be uh, checking each other because if a power runs away with too much of influence, uh, it's always dangerous. You know, it's, it's like in a state, it's the same thing. The checks and balances are something very important to keep freedom. Leaders like Dr. Van Opsburg plan for a united Europe that will be a powerful force for peace and democracy in the world. The birthplace of European democracy was ancient Greece. The Apostle Paul once proclaimed the true gospel to the superstitious inhabitants of Athens. Two thousand years later, Mr. Armstrong confronted political leaders and businessmen in the Athens Rotary Club with the truth about the future of Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It certainly is a great honor to be able to speak to the Rotary Club here in Athens, Greece, one of the most ancient cities in the world and the home of education, scholarship, and culture, uh, one of the oldest cultural cities in the world. I come to you as 
an unofficial ambassador for peace. Armies do not bring peace to a country. We have not learned the way to peace. Yesterday, I was having a meeting with some of the officials of your country, and there was considerable discussion about the plans for the unification of Europe. And uh, as one of your officials said, world peace depends upon European unification. I want to tell you something more about the coming unification of Europe. We not only have language barriers between the nations and nationalism, different aspirations, and all that sort of thing, and differences which have to be overcome, but many of the political leaders feel that they do not want to be church dominated. And yet, they're not going to be able to get together without the cohesiveness of church domination and the church bringing them all together. You see, even the church is divided between East and West. I can tell you, however, that I fully believe that that, is, that rift is going to be healed. And I fully believe that unification will be unexpectedly and suddenly achieved and the whole world is going to be stunned and astounded when it is announced that there is, in the continent of Europe, a new political unification, a nation as great or greater than the Soviet Union or the United States of America. <clears throat> Many listen respectfully, but they do not believe. The old nations of Europe are tired of war. They seek unification only for peaceful purposes. It is a bold dream, but the prophecies show that the union of the nations in Europe will result not in peace, but in the most terrible instrument of destruction the world has ever seen. The course of a united Europe was charted long ago in the days of the prophet Daniel, when the destiny of this world passed into the hands of four world-ruling empires. Daniel had seen four beasts representing those empires. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. And so God revealed that the fourth beast represented the fourth empire, which would continue in one form or another to the time of the end. Babylon fell to the Persian Empire in the 6th century BC. The Persians ruled the world for two centuries until 333 BC when the armies of Alexander destroyed Persia's power. This third empire, like unto a leopard, endured for nearly three more centuries before falling to the might of the Romans. And so, in 31 BC, the fourth beast was born as an empire, a power that would influence the affairs of the world until the second coming of Jesus Christ rescues mankind from its clutches. It was in the heyday of the first stage of the Roman Empire that Jesus Christ revealed the final details of its role in world history. On the Mediterranean island of Patmos, the elderly apostle John received the visions recorded in the Apocalypse or Book of Revelation. He saw in vivid detail a cataclysmic war that would take place at the end of the age. Against this backdrop of mayhem and destruction, 
John saw once again the savage beasts of Daniel's vision, now combined into one all-consuming monster. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to make war with him? Here, then, is a beast of fearsome proportion. The majesty of Babylon. The relentless force of Persia. The speed of the four-headed leopard of Greece. All combined to produce the formidable military might of the Romans. The ten horns represent ten governments to be formed from this beast, for it would arise again and again, casting its terrible shadow across nearly 1,600 years of history. The old Roman Empire fell in A.D. 476. Three kingdoms supplanted it the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. Then the Emperor Justinian restored the power of Imperial Rome in A.D. 554, as symbolized by the fourth horn of the beast. In A.D. 800, Charlemagne was crowned by the Pope on Christmas Day as a successor to the throne of Rome. In 962, the Sixth Horn became known as the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, when Pope John XII crowned Otto the Great. Then in 1530, the Habsburg dynasty reached the apex of its power when the Pope crowned Charles V as the Holy Roman Emperor. This dynastic Seventh Horn lasted until it was overthrown by Napoleon, who, seizing the crown from the hands of the Pope, crowned himself emperor. Napoleon's short reign ended in 1814, a date recognized in history as the end of a government that lasted 1260 years from the restoration of the Roman Empire in the West by Justinian. But the beast was not dead. By 1870, Garibaldi's efforts led to a united Italy thus beginning a chain of events that resulted in the formation of the ninth government to arise out of the Roman Empire. In 1923, the fascists under Mussolini had already come to power in Rome. Meanwhile, an attempt by the Nazi party to take over the German government was thwarted. But, Ten years later, Hitler did rise to power, and his Third Reich was soon to lunge out at Europe and hold it captive for five nightmare years. Hitler drew inspiration from ancient Rome. Even his architecture was inspired by the styles of the Caesars. Before this ninth fearsome horn of the Roman Empire had been crushed in the ruins of fascism and the Third Reich, much of Europe had been reduced to rubble. Forty years later, there is little left to remind the visitors of the ravages of war. The place where Hitler once goaded his people into frenzy is now a park where old people stroll and children play. Close by, the review stand at Zeppelin Field, where the legions of the Third Reich paraded before their Fuhrer, 
is now in ruins. But it is not the end. The terrible beast must appear once more for a final rampage of destruction. The prophecies show that ten nations or group of nations in Europe will join their economic, military, and political forces. It will be a fragile union, iron mixed with miry clay. But old rivalries and quarrels will be suspended for a time, held together by a common need and a common faith. These nations will become a third superpower. It may at first seem to be a peaceful union, but the Bible reveals the true nature that lies beneath the surface. Goaded into action, the beast will wreak havoc on the earth. The armies of the beast will lash out, laying waste the modern-day descendants of the ancient house of Israel. Then the beast turns in its rage on the nations of the east. Finally, powerful armies gather to fight a climactic battle for Jerusalem. So great is the fury, so awful the weapons, that humanity teeters on the brink of destroying all flesh, man and animals alike, from off the earth. Only the intervention of God can save humanity. And God does intervene. Jesus Christ returns to earth in power and glory, stopping the fighting, subduing the adversaries, rescuing his chosen people from cruel tribulation. Then this world, this civilization, that has known so much misery and destruction, will be over. Jesus Christ will establish his kingdom on the earth, which will lead the world into a thousand years of peace. Leaders of nations will come to this kingdom, eager to be taught the way that leads to peace. They will come to a tranquil land, developing in happiness and prosperity, living in harmony with God and his laws. Many then will remember that in the last days of that past civilization, an ambassador of this kingdom came to them with the advance news of a peaceful world tomorrow. And I am here to announce to you tonight that God is going to let this world come crashing down. But it's going to be replaced with a far better world that will be filled with love and with peace and joy and happiness and with greater production by far than anything we've dreamed of having yet and where everybody will be well educated and rightly and properly educated. I feel the responsibility and a voice has to cry out in this wilderness of religious confusion this wilderness of a Babylon of ideas and everybody having different ideas and everybody against everybody else. Someone has to cry out with that message and announce what is going to happen as certain as the sun is going to rise and set tomorrow. Now I know you haven't heard anything said like this before, but I have been sent here by that eternal living creator God the God over all races and all people and all nations to tell you the truth which missionaries have failed to tell you which religions have not known and have not been able to tell you 
which the colleges and universities do not teach, which science doesn't even understand. But you have been told tonight. Staying working. All right, it's working through the through the speaker over there. Yeah. Okay. All right. I uh, I switched our wiring around, and um, hopefully the microphone is going to stay here. We got a little bit more in this video. I'm going to come back to, but I wanted to come out at that point after Mr. Armstrong made those strong points that we should keep in mind. And here we are at this moment during this Feast of Tabernacles 2020. All right, now see, we have uh, one from three years ago, a tag up there. Let me put this at the bottom. Um, we're at the fourth day of the feast, the early part of the fourth day of the feast, if you're watching this live, which means we're about three and a half days into the millennium. Symbolically, that's about halfway. That's the seven-year feast, 1,000 years, three and a half is 500. Is half is you know three and a half is half of seven and half and that seven pictures a thousand years so half of a thousand is five hundred we're by halfway five hundred years into the millennium symbolically God's end time apostle will be there over those of us through whom God called to the Philadelphia era of His church we are a definite. Uh, segment of the body of Christ, the sixth era segment, and our our immediate supervisor leader over us is, is was and is and will be. I say is because God has preserved his publications, his speakings, and has not replaced the end time apostle with a new apostle. Even though Mr. Armstrong is in the grave, and the, there is history that shows you that an era can be without a human candlestick for a period of time, a human living candlestick. Thyatira is a good example. We can go through the details of this at one time. I'm just going to give you the highlights. The first candlestick of the Thyatira era died after so many years, and for more than a decade, there was not the Thyatira era continued, and there was not a replacement living human candlestick. Until more than a decade later, then that second candlestick, after presiding, overseeing the Thyatira era for a number of years, died. And another decade went by before there was finally a third human being replacement as the candlestick of the Thyatira era. It had three different men serving as that one candlestick. One lived and died. There was a space of time, not an immediate baton handover. A baton handover represents passing of eras anyway, but within one era, there was three different candlesticks because one man lived so long, died. That was a long era. Died and several decades went by. Then there was a new candlestick. You know, God has to look around and find somebody he considers worthy to be that candlestick. And the second man died. Decades went by, then there was finally a third candlestick. So here we are in the sixth era, the Philadelphia era. It continues. God's end time apostle gave us a truth on this, that the Laodicean era, the seventh and final era, does not begin until after the fifth seal has opened. And why is that true? It's true because as that era is explained in the nine verses that directly address the Laodicean era, there are only nine. There's a tenth verse that's kind of an indirect addressing of the Laodicean era, but the nine that directly address the Laodicea era are found in Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 14, going through verse 22. That's nine verses, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Nine verses. And the central verse, verse 18, 
keys us in as to the timing of that verse. The first, the four verses before verse 18, verses 14 through 17, 14, 15, 16, 17, take a look at them. You'll see they describe the condition of those who form the Laodicean era. Yes, that attitude of the people who form that era are present with us now and many people, and they have been, even while Mr. Armstrong was alive, such that Mr. Armstrong at one time pounded the lectern and warned everybody that we are in danger of becoming the Laodicean era brethren because of the prominence of the attitude that was even obvious, manifested, big time then. But some woke up, Mr. Armstrong, wake up, brethren! And some, some of us, woke up. You know, Matthew 25, I think it is, talks about all ten virgins. Being, saying there were ten virgins, and it says all ten of them were asleep. You know, had drifted off to sleep. But half of them had done enough that they had oil. Even though they were sleeping, they had oil, and, and they... After they were awakened, they, they ran and replenished their oil. The others continued in their sleepy Laodicean state, even though they were keeping the commandments of God. That's not enough there. We need prayer. We need the two conditions of Luke 21, 36 to help us be able to... Let me go to... Let's see if we can change this. I have to go to the screen over my shoulder on the other side here. So let's open up and let's go over there and I'm going to punch up Luke 21, verse 36. We need to be exercising these two conditions, both now during the feast and after the feast, especially when you either go home or if you're already home exercising a principle uh, out of the Old Covenant that's wise about uh, quarantining yourself when disease is either present with you or is rampant in the neighborhood. Stay out of the neighborhood where that, those diseases are. Thankfully, our president has been released from the hospital, and we'll be watching the news on that. I may even try to get a license for some of those news clips and punch them in on tomorrow's program and kind of update us while we're in the millennium to, you know, celebrating this millennium, and we should be out rejoicing. There are restaurants you can go to where they seat, seat you at every other table. They keep a table with no occupants at it between you and the next group. And that's believed to help hold down the passing of any virus, saliva, uh, germs, uh, how it's spread through the air, through the saliva. When people speak and there's little particles of saliva in your, in your voice for a few feet, and they figure six feet safe enough without a mask. And then if you got a mask on top of that, you're even safer. Uh, but uh, in Alabama, they let you go eat out as long as you keep a table between you and the next group. You know, a blank table. Nobody seated in the table next to you. Uh, your group can sit together. And so you can fellowship. I mean, the health experts allow you that much. Uh, excuse me, um, but there may still be some wisdom, and it's by your faith. If you want to stay home, we can convocate right here. Some of you stay home, and greetings to a lot of you who I know are. Some of you had planned to go some places that canceled down at the last minute. And look, I want to send out a special greeting to a few of you that I know have suffered some rough times, like Dane and Jacob in California and Susanville, where they had the big fires roaring at them several weeks ago at 50 miles an hour and the father Dane made a request for prayer and I shot that out to several hundred of you and many of you responded back we're praying and the fire stopped half a half hour away from them and I think it destroyed 13 homes but thankfully it stopped and didn't come up into that neighborhood where Dane and his son Jacob hoist live and so when I last talked to them a few days ago, uh, their plans for going here or there uh, had canceled. Now, I need to, I need to talk to you guys. I, I'm curious. I'd like to know where you are now, how things are going, 
Uh, we have uh, we gave did an anointing for Dane on a lifetime lifelong uh, condition of asthma he's had since a child, and I hope some of you will pray for Dane Host on the asthma situation he got anointed for, and his son got anointed for uh, seizures, which he's had a history of, and he had a pretty rough one here recently, and we ask you to continue the prayers. I need to see how he's doing. We had a long talk the other day, and uh, uh, brother, did you hear? Let me, uh, so let's pray for one another. Now let me go back to something that was mentioned. Did I cover this point here? Watch and pray. Christ told us to pray always. This is a prerequisite, and then I'm going to go back to something in that film where the man from Lebanon, the leader from Lebanon, Mr. Armstrong had been speaking to, talked about that that being who's going to be put away on the holy day just before the Feast of Tabernacles, on the day of at one mint, and how one of the things he does to be effective is to conceal himself. We'll talk about, I want to talk about that in a second, but, uh, but staying on track with what I mentioned and didn't finish a moment ago about Two of the conditions we must do in addition to observing the commandments, you know, one of, one of which is remember the Sabbath, both weekly and annual, to keep them holy. And they have holy days within these Feast of Tabernacles, and then we have regular feast days, like today is. Day four is a regular feast day. It's, it's the third of three regular feast days after the first day, which is the, a holy day. And... Christ told us, above and beyond keeping the commandments, we should watch and pray without ceasing. The word always can be rendered as without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. And then he gives us a reason for it. So that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are going to happen, beginning, commencing with the opening of the fifth seal, Great Tribulation, and to be accounted worthy to stand before the Son of Man in the first resurrection. That's very important. Number should be our number one goal to be able to be there standing before Christ in the first resurrection, being transformed from flesh to spirit, being born into the kingdom of God, being a part of the family of God, becoming the bride, the wife. We are the bride now engaged, but becoming actually not aborting, not not uh, disqualifying, but actually being able to make it to the marriage supper and be married to Jesus Christ and become his wife throughout eternity. That's only offered to the first resurrection, to the spring harvest, the small spring harvest, the big, great fall harvest. They come in as children. So it's, it is a most blessed resurrection to be called to this first resurrection. It shall not be taken lightly. If there are some things that you selfishly want and say, I don't care about that first resurrection. I want to do this and I want to do that before I die. Well, God may allow you to do this or that before you die and then come up in the second resurrection and have missed the thousand years of the millennium that this feast pictures, missed the opportunity to become part of the brideship, the wife of Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, you come into the family, all right, but it, it's different. It's not as blessed. It's, it's wonderful, you know, those who come in in the big, 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 big colossal fall harvest. Oh, it's going to be a wonderful time to celebrate. It's, it's great being a kid. I think back to my childhood, including the spankings I got from my dad. Some of you that say, oh, your dad spanked you too much. No, he didn't. He didn't spank me enough. I got away with a whole lot more than my dad caught and spanked me for. My dad followed the biblical uh, prescription to spare not the rod, else you spoil the child. Look, some of you know how bad humans can be, even myself. I know how bad I can be. I would be far worse than I have been. Those of you that know I've made some screw-ups in my life, I'd be far worse had my dad spared the rod on me. Because when I screw up, I think back to my dad spanking me, or when I'm tempted to do wrong. You know, David did an ultimate wrong. He committed adultery and then killed the man's wife with whom he had adultery, whom he had pregnant, after trying to deceive the man to go have sex with your wife so that you'll think that kid she's about to have is was, was, was because of you, was your kid. And then when the man wouldn't go have 
sleep with his wife. David sent a note with him to the commanders to put him on the front line, and when the battle gets in the most heavy condition, withdraw from him. The commanders knew that was a death sentence put upon that man. They didn't know that man was a good warrior and loyal and faithful. And, of course, his commanders, they knew the fruits of that man. They wondered, why has David have committed this man to a death sentence? Well, when the truth came out, it was because he had gotten that man's wife pregnant. And he, he was trying to uh, cover that sin. But God knew it. God sent a prophet to reveal the fact that it was known and that David's conniving was, <laughs> well, he was caught in it, you know, brother, and so look, and David had, was already, already had God's spirit to a certain measure. Can we, uh, can we make mistakes after we have God's spirit? Bible shows us example, yes, we can make some pretty big, stupid, bonehead mistakes. At least, we're in a time that uh, we're going to go through the first few decades of that millennium having to clean up all the mess, and we've got a little bit more related to that, but I wanted to pull out and talk to you for a moment, and let me see, what is it that we have over here that we could uh, take a look at? Let's take a look at a, a slide I have up over here on this screen that shows us what the Bible describes in Daniel 11 verses 40 and 41 about now I want you to be thinking look we're celebrating the millennium and the time of rejoicing looking forward to it but we also need some sobriety even during this feast especially a feast where all around you a virus pandemic is rampant and so you need to take precautions and care against that and with that prevalence, you know, God is uh, wanting us to think what's between right now as we celebrate a symbol of what's coming and what's going to actually be happening, happenings, actualities, between now and the next major event in prophecy, the opening up of the fifth seal. And that comes three and a half years before the next feast, the feast day of the fall season, we just pictured Christ's return. That's that next, the opening of that next seal, the fifth seal, Great Tribulation, runs for three and a half years before Christ returns. We need to be thinking about that. Our operational base in the United States, and those of you in the United Kingdom, it'll be bashed at the very beginning of the fifth seal because. Ezekiel 6.6 6 is addressed primarily, as God's end-time apostle has explained correctly to us. Ezekiel 6 and verse 6 is addressed to the two sons of Joseph, which today are the United Ephraim, the United Kingdom, and Manasseh in the United States. And that prophecy says, all if we don't repent, and God tells us, Israel is so obstinate he won't repent. She, he, modern day descendants of Israel will not repent, especially the birthright promised kids. Ephraim in the United Kingdom, Manasseh in the United States. We won't repent. And therefore, God says, okay, you don't repent. All of your cities and all your dwelling places, all of your cities will be laid waste. They'll be razed to the ground, destroyed. A um, third of the people will be killed immediately upon the hydrogen bomb attacks. Another third will die shortly thereafter from the radiation fallout. And then the third that managed to live through that will be taken captive by the beast, the European armies. Those who are counted worthy to escape get to escape just before that blitzkrieg of blowing up all the cities of the UK and the US, some won't believe the reality of it and won't go. They'll be left behind. And if left alive, then we'll have to refuse to work on the Sabbath and refuse to bow down before the image of the beast or have their 
heads cut off, be burned at the stake, in some way killed by the beast. But those who are called and were keeping the commandments of God, who are part of the true church, but who failed to do this thing we made reference to in uh, the verse on the screen over here, about watching and praying always so that you can be accounted worthy to escape. You find yourself, you didn't do that. I was keeping the commandments. Well, you didn't do the rest of the ball game. And you, in spite of the fact, as verse 17 of Revelation 12 says, you kept, were keeping the commandments of God. You even had the testimony of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of prophecy. You had that. You had that understanding. But you failed to do all you needed to do. Therefore, you were Laodicean, lukewarm. You kept the nice parts of the commandments, even the feast. I mean, keeping the Feast of Tabernacles is a delight. You save second tithe. You go to some fancy, dancy, nice place. Eat like a pig. <laughs> you know, well, not quite like a pig. You don't eat pork, you know. But you eat what you lust for as long as it's according to God's law. And have a rosy, dozy, wonderful, delightful, hoopy doo good time. But hopefully you're staying sober. You know, you can have some feast of booze, but say stay sober enough and on your knees in prayer and continuing medita meditation, continuing Bible study, repenting of sin. You're going to find yourself, probably, if you haven't put out all sins, God's going to let you see it during this feast. And when he does, you need to get on your knees and say, God, I really do want to put that out of my life, beginning right now because of what this feast pictures and what's about to happen just ahead of us. I want to, I don't want to be left behind, and I don't want to suffer this great tribulation. I want to escape it. I mean, that's the biggest, wonderful, most promise. That should be our, our immediate goal, number two goal. Our number one goal should overall be, yes, I want to be part of that first resurrection. God has called me to it. If I don't make it, if I disqualify, I don't have a second resurrection opportunity unless I'm a church kid. I only have a third resurrection uh, consequence if I blow the first. Now, you church kids, Mr. Armstrong has said, you have to decide you, even though you're not cut off from God the way the rest of the world's kids are, you have to tell God you want this first resurrection. Now, once you make that election, you've made a very serious election. Then it's first or third. Ain't no short top stop. Ain't no second base for you. It's first or third. Um. You make it to home plate via first, um, or you get caught off at third base and suffer that consequence, third resurrection. All right, I hope my little crazy analogy makes some sense to some of you and brings some, bring, helps bring some sobriety to some of you who are over, you know, you, you call this the Feast of Booths. Only you change the pronunciation from B-O-O-T-H-S to B-O-O-Z-E and make it the Feast of Booze. Some of you overdo that. Some of you need to cut that out altogether when you can't handle it. When you, one makes you go to two and two makes you go to three and three to four and then you're out the door, you know, so to speak. So, uh, you know, sometimes you, if you've got a problem on one side of the road, sometimes you need to go to the other extreme to overcome it. And so sometimes people don't understand when you're correcting yourself, you may go to an extreme. You say, why? That's unbalanced. Why are you way over there? Well, because I was way over here, and I'm trying to get to the middle, so i got to go over here for a while. And then when I come back, you know, as I start to come back, I can stop myself when I get to the middle. You know, we have to work resourcefully on overcoming sometimes and ask God for God's help and acknowledge to him, confess to him our sins and ask him to help us overcome it. And maybe if you got some close friends who you know will pray fervently for you and caringly and not spread your sin, you know, you might want to ask a few of them and then they'll touch base with you and check, hey, how you doing? I'm praying for you. How you doing on that over drinking? Are you pulling it back? Yeah, I've, I've, I've got it in check. Thank you. Your fervent prayer has worked already. Well, let me check within a few weeks and see if it holds. Okay. You check back. Yeah, it's holding, Stephen. Thank you for the prayers. Okay. I'm going to check back with you again in a few weeks. Yeah, it's still holding. Okay, I'm going to forget you now. I think you got it. <laughs> I'm going to check back with you a few years, see if, any, see if you've somehow retroverted. You know, not a bad idea. 
keep track on your friends care about your friends are we our brothers keepers we're not exactly their keepers but do we care should we care about one another should we go to one another if we genuinely see a fault now some of you get mad at a brother and you just throw things at him in an emotional fit and some of those things you're throwing are things you yourself are guilty of and doesn't really apply to your brother maybe some extremely small degree but you blow it out of proportion and you you harm and put gulfs in your friendship you may have to suffer the consequences of doing that but you shouldn't shouldn't cast off your brother forever but um, pray for them mr. Armstrong said the people he prays for the most and first in his prayers are his enemies so if you're distraught with someone or have or have an enemy put them in your prayers Christ told us to pray for our enemies and, and those who despitefully use us pray for them with loving concern if you have real love you'll be praying for them even if nothing else is happening with that person even though you might selfishly want it to all right, that's all I'm going to say about that. And uh, we need to be careful and loving with one another if we're going to be part of that same body. You know, God has got places he's going to put us in the body. And, you know, some are part of the head, the eyes, nose, ears, mouth or something. And others are part of the, the feet, the toes. Others are part of the internal organs. The less beautiful, but the more essential. You know, like fine china is delicate. But it's more valuable than, you know, the, the bull. Uh, all right, but here's a graphic showing where Daniel mentions is an area that is protected. Daniel 11, verse 41. The only place mentioned in the Bible is being protected from the reach of the beast, the power of the beast, during the Great Tribulation. It's the land of the children of Ammon, Moab in the middle, and Edom in the south. I think I have a closer up shot of that. I can punch up. Let's see, is it? Oh, these buttons aren't working. All right, let's see. It's because I, I got two essences of this thing open, and I probably just screwed up the place I was trying to preserve. Let me see. Did I? I, I just messed up the place I was trying to preserve in the other uh, video. Let me see. I'm going to start that and see if I can get it back to where I wanted to pick up. Eh. Alright. Yeah, that, that's close. I'll come back and check that again in a moment. Let me see if I can advance this in a different way. Um, yeah, here's a closer shot of uh, a topographical map of Moab. And I can... Uh, well, which one's the better shot? Let's see. If we go here, we can pull it in full screen. And you can see uh, on the left side of this map is Israel. It's labeled as Judah on this older map, but that's Israel, Middle East, where we're going to be flown on two wings of a great eagle once we are determined to be, have, be accounted worthy to escape. And let me see if I got a better version of this shot. Ah, uh, no, that cuts off the tail end of Edom there. I think that this is better. Um, but then, verses 15 and 16, after Jerusalem is, if verse 15, after, uh, we need to also go to Matthew 24 or Luke 21 that tells us to watch for when Jerusalem is compassed with an army, when an army surrounds Jerusalem. That's our cue to skidoo, to the mountains. And so, we're going we're gonna to travel long distance if we're in Jerusalem. I don't know where God's going to take us. He doesn't tell us. You know, he just tells us he flies us to the place of escape on two wings of an eagle. But in between that and getting into that place of escape, he tells us to watch for when an, ar an army that's going to chase us. Well, that army's going to be there doing that after it surrounds Jerusalem. We're told then to flee to the mountains. So we're probably dropped off somewhere in the Middle East on, on the west side of the of the uh, of the Jordan River that leads up into the Dead Sea and the waters there and 
we're the fleet of the mountains. So we've got to go around the water, if we're on foot, go down where we're going to have to cross the Jordan River. God may have to do a little miracle, hold up the waters for us to get over. An army is going to be on our tail, verse 15. And then we get across, and we go in, if we go in through the southern tip down here, the low, low end of this map at Edom, there's Petra down there. And that's where the big rock walls were. And with an army chasing us, it's just like Pharaoh's army chasing ancient Israel. We got this army by the devil chasing us. We get in between these rock walls, and then verse 16, God says, I help the woman. The woman in prophecy is a church, and in Revelation 12, it's the true church. And I open up a, the earth and swallow the army that's after those accounted worthy to escape. So the devil's army gets swallowed up in a big sinkhole probably because God's done a big earthquake. And then those rock walls of Petra fall in on the army. Now, if you watch the Ten Commandment movie, or read it from the scriptures, you see that the people of ancient Israel and Moses, they get through the Red Sea to the other side before God totally collapses the gelled up walls of the Red Sea onto the army of Pharaoh. So, scenarios similar, not exact. God causes an earthquake to open up a hole. Well, then the rock walls are going to fall in, just like the gelled up walls of the Red Sea collapse on the ancient army of Pharaoh. The rock walls of Petra will fall in on the modern army of the devil, chasing those accounted worthy to escape. I mean, the analogy carries that through. Mr. Armstrong could see that duality, analogy, when he saw the big rock walls of Petra and a passageway through there. Wow, this reminds me of the ancient Israel passing through the walls of the Red Sea. And an army chased them, an army's going to be chasing us, those who are accounted worthy to escape. Now, now verse 17 talks about a remnant, some who are left behind, and they're told to buy of God gold tried in the fiery trial of martyrdom. Right, what else do I possibly have in these slides that might be worth taking a look at. Now, Mr. Armstrong, the video 1985, we're going to go back to just a little bit more of it in a moment. He mentioned these kings that are shown here. Um, starting in the upper left-hand corner, you've got, um, at the very top on the left, you've got Justinian. And the film summarized the events through Napoleon, who's in the, the middle on the second row. Down here on the second row in the middle, there's Napoleon. Well, in between them, well, the video did detail actually the Pope crowning Otto uh, Charlemagne and then Otto the Great on the far right side on the top and then the fourth of the five kings, Charles V, and then to the right of him, Napoleon. And those the reign between Justinian and Napoleon ran for 1260 continuous years, fulfilling a prophecy. And the... Uh, We'll go through that someday when we have time to detail that out. But the point here is Mussolini, who you see next on the second row there on the far right side, was the one is of, uh, let me get the scripture up on the screen that relates to the seven kings. That's going to be found in Revelation 17, 17 and verse 10. We can pull out here. Let's go over here to, uh, to the scripture Get the scripture screen in view, and we've got Revelation 10, I mean, verse 10 of Revelation 17 up on the screen. And uh, let's pull it a little closer. This verse explains there are seven kings. Now, Mr. Gilmore, our Gilmore, the narrator in the 1985 feast film, referred to the fourth horn through, through the ninth horn. Uh, as being Justinian through Mussolini. Uh, now, when we look at these seven kings, these seven kings are your fourth horn through your tenth horn. See, do I have that numbered right? Let's see, if you've got uh, four, all right, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, ten. That's seven kings. The fourth horn through the tenth horn equals your first king through your seventh king. Six of them have come and gone. 
five of them came in the form. Now, the the first three horns are what's pictured on the front end of that beast. Let's see. Can we go over there to? Let me see where my shots are. Okay, we can go over here to this this uh, beast that comes up in Revelation 13 from out of the ocean has ten horns on the top. And looking at the front of the beast head, the head the the seventh head of this fourth beast has three little horns on the front. Now those were plucked up by the Pope early on in the game. So then in Revelation there's made a, a reference to these ten horns are made as the remaining seven horns, the last seven horns. And those last seven horns, the reason God makes a distinction for the remaining seven horns after the three are plucked up, because the Pope rides these last seven horns, and they are the same in symbolic prophecy as what we see over here on the far wall on the other side with the second beast from Revelation 13, the beast from the land. There are six heads on this beast, and those six heads are the same as the last seven horns horns. And the seventh head on this beast has ten horns, but these ten horns are not the same as the ten horns on the beast from the ocean. The horns on the beast from the ocean represent uh, cons concurrent, uh, not concurrent, but consecutive governments, one after another, not existing at the same time as one another. The first three horns after they're plucked up, then here in 554 comes Justinian, the fourth horn the first of the seven remaining horns. And then by the time you get to the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth horn, the uh, Napoleon, uh, that's the fifth head of the beast, uh, the fifth head of this beast from the... Uh, from the land, you got to just you got to have these visualizations to understand this. Of the five heads on the uh, are the six heads on the right side of this, this graphic. Uh, those are your first five kings that are fallen, plus the one is sixth king, and then the seventh head on this beast is the seventh king of Revelation 17:10. Now there are times when I think it's appropriate to go in this in greater careful detail. For now. I'm just going to come back here with you, and we're going to go. For those, some of you understand that already. Anyway, I've, on regular Sabbaths, I've gone through that sometimes an awful, awful lot. But for our purposes here, we just want to keep in mind the scripture. There are seven kings. They are the last seven horns of those ten horns on the beast from the ocean. They are the same as the seven heads on the beast from the land. Because those seven heads are the last seven horns, horn four through horn ten. I make that reference because Art Gilmore was referring to the scripture where he talked about the fourth, from Daniel, where he talked about it as the fourth horn through the tenth horn. Those are the same as your first king through your seventh king. That tenth horn, we don't know who it is yet, is the seventh king that we're watching who's called the other is yet to come here. Um, Okay, I'm going to bring that full forward just for a moment. Let's take a good look at this verse. Then we're going to look at who was who and who we're watching for to be who. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. Those are the ones that were spoken of in the Feast film, 1985 film, Justinian through Napoleon. And one is. That's the one spoken of in the film, represented by Garibaldi having reunited Italy and... Mussolini popping up, getting a concordant from the Vatican, and then going, running in and conquering Ethiopia and proclaiming himself Il, the new Il Duce, the new Julius Caesar, and I have restored the Holy Roman Empire. God caused Mr. Armstrong to understand that, which occurred between 1935 and 1945. While Mr. Armstrong was alive and preaching, he was able to announce that the one is of Revelation 17, verse 10 here, is Mussolini. He has come. The one is, is truly is. Before 1935, where the Apostle John has had written that one is, pre a present tense form of verbiage, well, that one is hadn't even been born at the time the Apostle Paul wrote that one is. And it wouldn't become one is until Mussolini was born. 
Now, part of the understanding of verse 10 means we've got to go back to verse 8 of Revelation 17. Let's bring that full forward where it says that the beast that you saw was. Well, when was he? He was primarily was between 554 and 1814, 1260-year period of continuous reign. The beast was active. And then it says, and is not. Well, after 1814, that beast went into the, the abyss, into the bottomless pit, but not killed. He just was like locked up and dormant, ill, sick, being revived, being healed, the wounds, his wounds being healed, and he being made ready to come out of it again. Because look at the next part and says, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Well, he was until 1814 from 554, and then from 1814 to 1935, he was not. He was in the pit, dormant, sleeping, healing. Ah, but then 1935, in the first type of this fulfillment, he ascended out of that bottomless pit, out of the abyss is the original Greek word for bottomless pit. But he didn't, he went only into a mild form of perdition. Um, I know World War II was pretty hectic, and people wondered about, wow, what's going on here? But people in America still played. We still had big bands and big band music being created even during the war. Uh, Glenn Miller, as an enlistee in the war, war, would go around playing his military band, you know, with, with Glenn, and playing big band t tunes of World War II. They're very popular today. People do swing dancing to it. That occurred during round two of World War. The, you know, the major last world war, when the beast was in the form of Mussolini, with Hitler under him, between 1935 and 1945. 1945, April 28, Mussolini shot in the belly, hung upside down from the, can uh, the canopy of an SO gasoline station, put this uh, beast back into the abyss, the bottomless pit, as it's worded here. But look... Prophecy is dual. Duality in prophecy tells us Mussolini was only a type, a forerunner of what's coming big time when this beast shall ascend again out of this bottomless pit and this time really go into perdition and making those that dwell on the earth wonder whose names are not, were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was, now again, he was, last part of this verse, last line, he was from 554 to 1814, then in the abyss, in the bottomless pit, until 1935, he became, was active again between 1935 and 1945, and now is not yet again, and yet is because he's not dead. He yet is because that beast is not dead. He's just in that bottomless pit, that abyss, healing, being revived, being made ready to ascend one last time in a colossal, huge manifesto, big way, as the seventh king of Revelation 10 comes out of that pit, ascends out of that abyss out of that bottomless pit as the seventh king to then have that beast power again be uh, is you know and active and leading up to the return of Christ with war that unless Christ return when he does when he will when he promises all flesh would be annihilated from off the face of the earth I put that verse up during the feast film 1985 while Mr. Armstrong was talking. Brother, I'm hoping that we know we are to rejoice during this feast. As soon as this service is over, some of you will, if you delayed at the time we're on, didn't have your lunch yet, going to want to run out and eat. And great, good, you should, and rejoice and have whatever you lust for. If you've saved your second tithe well, have plenty of money to spend, look for others who were in less fortunate situations, maybe making sacrifices because of a work God's got them doing or whatever. And be sure you look out for and help those people too and show love to them. And don't judge them. You know, if they need judging, God will judge them. They, their own conscience. You know, somebody else pays the bill for you and you should have had the money. 
you know, God can make the old conscience work, and you've got a year where you can make some changes this year, or at least make a good effort toward it. Now, if you have handicaps and various things that prevent you, hey, all of that should be factored in. I mean, there's a reason why God has a third tithe year. Are, are, are those of you tuned in here, are you remembering third tithe? You know, you count it from your baptism date. One, two, three, four, five, six, skip a year seven, and then do one, two, three, again, four, five, six. Those of you that understand what I'm saying will be properly reminded. If you really want blessings, if you don't want God to withhold, withhold blessings from you, you need to do the one, two, three, the four, five, six. Set, a, you know, uh, set aside third tithe for the needy. You can do it direct, or you could possibly do it through this ministry, which Robert Collins set up a third tithe fund. Nobody actually put into it, when I've spent, even when I've mentioned problems. But you can do it directly. You can take that, but be sure you do it. Spend it on a, a needy person, even anonymously sometimes. And, you know, watch God's hand of blessing. Do His commands. Keep it. Even though we're scattered, do it the best you can. And God will either bring along, as Tom Williams expects, somebody he'll make a new pastor general who keeps the, uh, the truth faithfully, or, as I believe is going to happen, we're so close to the end of things, Christ is just going to, once he knows who's approved, once he knows who is doing those things that I mentioned to you, that quotes Christ saying we need to be doing from Luke 21:36 watching the four active seals, praying for the people every day, all the time, without ceasing, who are affected by these four seals. Now, our president and his wife, the first lady, Donald Trump and his wife, are affected by the fourth seal disease epidemic. And we should be praying very heartily for him, who loves this country and the people of the offspring of Manasseh. Joseph's son, Manasseh. Now, unfortunately, the media gets on a hype, gets stirred up by those who are not of Manasseh. Some go to extremes called white supremacy and it causes uh, the birthright sons to be talked down against as if the blessings God gives to this nation as a promise he gave to the offspring of Manasseh son of Joseph, son of Jacob, Israel. Uh, those blessings, they, 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 people talk down against where the source of those blessings are, as if everybody should have an entitlement to those blessings that God says are given to the world through these people who should be caring and loving and wanting to share those in appropriate ways. So, there's all kind of injustices going on. Mr. Jer Trump has tried to, in principle, uphold the way God gave blessings, but he's he's being forced into a corner, to uh, because of extremists, to to uh, he, he's you know you see it it's in the news every day and of course I'm trying to get the news program back on where we can show clips that evidence these things themselves. All right. And I appreciate your prayers about that. Let's go back to today. This is a prophecy for us today. Sorry, I had that volume a little low. Hopefully that's better. And we need to remember, this is coming. It's gonna, some people will wake up with a big shock with the city next to them blown up. Some will be in those cities and be, you know, not wake up um, if you did, weren't counted, accounted worthy to escape. And this is ahead of us because this nation will not repent. We're getting worse and worse by the moment. And uh, let's see. Willing, everybody stay safe, rejoice, and join the watch parties later today, and we'll see you, God willing, join us again manana.